What if you didn't have to struggle with food? Imagine yourself looking in the mirror and loving what you see. Imagine a world where you never have to think about your weight. What if you woke up in the morning and you no longer feared food? How will you feel when your weight is no longer a problem? What if you could change your mind and change your body? I used to be slim. What happened to me? If you are overweight, you probably know how to lose weight already. This is horrible. I feel so fat. You have lost tens or even hundreds of pounds over and over and over. The problem is, you keep finding them again. So you try every diet you hear about, but you always regain the weight that you lost, and sometimes even more. You send your money to a health club every month, but you never get there. Why am I even doing this? When am I going to go? I don't want anybody to see me there. You spend hundreds of dollars on equipment you never use. Who am I kidding? I should just sell this thing. Weight loss books line your shelves, gathering dust. I'm so sick of dieting. I'm always so hungry. You even think about surgery because nothing else has worked. Maybe I should do it. Is that the only way? What am I thinking? Look at all those people. They all look so happy. Why can't I be that way? You have looked everywhere for help, yet nothing seems to work for long. And every time you try and fail, you find yourself feeling more and more alone. What if you've been looking in the wrong place? What if the answer does not lie outside of you after all? What if there's an inner way? Dr. Dave Smiley. Three years ago, I found myself at a crossroads. The previous year, I'd gone through a bankruptcy and a divorce. I was working in a prison, taking antidepressants, and I weighed almost 300 pounds. I was miserable. That spring, I watched a film about something called the law of attraction. According to the film, we create our lives with our thoughts and our beliefs. We attract to us those things that we think about most of the time whether they're things that we want or things that we don't want. When I watched that film, I had an epiphany. Suddenly, everything made sense. I understood that I had created this miserable life. I began to wonder, what would my life be like if I started paying attention to my thoughts? What could I create if I started living my life on purpose? That was three years ago. I retired from my job, feeling fully awake and alive for the first time in my life and set out to find a way to lose weight without following some regimented plan of diet and exercise, without weighing and measuring and counting and slicing and dicing my life into little pieces. I knew there had to be another path, another way, something that was more natural, more peaceful, and more spiritual. I knew that the old way, the outer way, wasn't working. The problem with dieting is you're looking for a solution outside of yourself. 
And then when the program doesn't work or you fall off the wagon, you beat yourself up because you think that there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. A diet often tells you what you can't have. And it's basic human nature to want what you can't have. If there were a child in this room and I put 47 toys on the floor and said, you can have any one of those toys except this rock that's sitting right here, what do you think that that child would want? He, he would gravitate toward the rock. So whatever we can't have, we want. And if you think about it, the diet industry is pretty much based on failure. They'd be out of business if the product actually works. And they know that. I tried the cabbage soup diet. I tried the Atkins diet. I tried every diet that you can possibly think of. I even made up my own diet of fasting and eating whatever I wanted on the weekends and then restricting my diet throughout the week. And none of these things worked for me because I didn't have the inner knowing, the inner knowing that I was valuable and I had purpose and I am worthy of love. You know, when people talk about weight loss, what they want to understand is that the subconscious mind is programmed to look for whatever you lose. If you lose your car keys like that, you begin to look for them. And it's exactly the same with weight. When you lose weight, you instantly start looking for it. And it doesn't take long until you find it. That's why diets, people are going up and down, they probably lose and gain tons in their lifetime. When what to eat is coming from outside of yourself, you are always going to be resistant to that because it's coming from outside of you. None of us likes being told what to do. We have this inner toddler that likes to rebel. During World War II, Dr. Ansel Keys conducted a study to examine the effects of semi-starvation on a group of healthy young men. For six months, they lived on less than half of the calories they normally would eat. As a result, they lost weight, their metabolism slowed down, and they became obsessed with food. When they were allowed to start eating normally again, many began binge eating, sometimes up to 5,000 calories per day. Does this sound familiar? Although the purpose of this study was to examine the effects of semi-starvation, the number of calories the men consumed each day was about the same as they might receive on a weight loss diet today. So of course you're going to binge when you come off a diet. You've been starving yourself. Who looks outside dreams. Who looks inside awakes. The first place to start when you decide that you're really serious about beating this whole weight thing is to go within. Because the power to overcome this lies inside of you. Now, the room that I'm in right now, there is a temperature setting for this room. And when the temperature gets a little warmer or a little cooler, that instrument notifies either the air conditioner or the heater to make a shift so that the setting stays secure. And the temperature doesn't vary very far off, up or down from the setting. Our paradigm is the setting about what we believe about ourselves and what we believe we can have and what's possible. So if we have a setting that says, I'm a fat person, if we have a setting that says, I always fail, if we have a setting that says, I'm never going to make it, I'm not OK, or if we have a setting that says, this is, this is just not going to happen for me, then the mind goes to work to produce circumstances that are the coherent or the expression of those patterns. In a recent study by Harvard psychologists, a group of hotel maids was given a health screening. They were then told that the work they were doing each day, such as making beds, vacuuming, and cleaning, is good exercise and satisfies the Surgeon General's guidelines for an active lifestyle. Within one month, on average, they lost weight, lowered their blood pressure, decreased their body fat, and lowered their BMI, despite no change in their diet and exercise. Just by changing their minds, they changed their bodies. When you're dealing with inner way, you're creating an image in your mind and then your body must execute that image. The body is an instrument of the mind. The body is like a dumb terminal. It's only going to do what you tell it to do. It has no inductive reasoning capacity on its own. It, uh, it's a servant of the mind. You have your body, and then you have your mental 
image of your body, the mental picture that you carry around in your heads. And it's important when you're working at changing your body and particularly losing weight, you have to change your mental pictures along with it. This will get you in trouble otherwise. If you've ever had the experience of losing a lot of weight and then you still feel like the fat person walking around, the reason why that is is because you haven't changed the mental pictures to go along with this new body that you have. The inner way is when you are connected to the power that's within you, when you're reminding yourself that you are already beautiful, that you're already perfect just the way you are, that you can trust yourself, that you are making positive change and you're having fun while you're doing it. Going within is a principle for going inside of yourself. It may be as simple as going into your own mind and kind of hearing that self-talk. You know, we all have that little voice or you know, sometimes several voices, the little critics and judges. That's one thing, it's going within your mind. What are you hearing about whether or not you're going to be successful? If you say to yourself, I'm not gonna get fat or I am losing weight, the subconscious sees the image of someone heavy or it sees the image of weight. Whereas if you say to yourself, I'm getting a little bit thinner today, or I feel a little bit thinner today, that phrase will put an image into the subconscious of something positive, of something slimming. I was the fat person in the office, and that was my identity. And that, to me, when you talk about the inner way and changing your mind, when you change the way you think, you're changing your identity. And that, for me, is really what this is about. So many of my clients will come to me telling me the same story. They'll say, oh, my mother always told me I was fat. I always thought I was a fat kid. But when I look back on pictures, I was actually a very normal, healthy-looking weight. What happens is if we hold an image of ourselves as being overweight, if we hold an image of ourselves as being a certain way, then our subconscious mind will start to organize around that image and create that reality for ourselves. So while a lot of my clients weren't overweight when they started believing that they were, eventually they became overweight, and so they're overweight now. The inner way is about changing the way you think about yourself. It's about tapping into your subconscious mind to create the body and the life that you want. You see, the subconscious mind controls your body. Think about it. Every day, millions of cells go about their daily activity without any effort on the part of your conscious mind. Oxygen is taken from the air and transported throughout your body. Carbon dioxide is removed. When you are injured, white blood cells rush instantly to the site of the trauma, removing harmful bacteria and preventing infection. When you eat, food is broken down into essential amino acids and sugars to provide energy for your body. All of this is controlled by your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is controlled by your self-image, which are the deepest beliefs that you have about yourself. So if you want to change your body, you have to change that self-image. The law of attraction says that if we focus on fat or weight, we're going to attract more of that to ourselves. So with the inner way, instead of focusing on fat, we focus on fit. Face yourself, imagine yourself, and trust yourself. You never find yourself until you face the truth. If you wake up and you do not like who you see in the mirror, you're like, look at this, these rolls and, and this, this big, gigantic, body and that shame and self-loathing, you need to forgive yourself. If you struggle with food and struggle with overeating, you are carrying that evidence on your body and the world sees it. And that's different than someone whose issues are more internal. So you have to forgive yourself. You have to believe that even though you may not like this body that you have, you were doing the best that you could. You were doing the best that you could at the time. Now you know better and you are doing better. 
I was so scared to have food in the house because I knew if I had food in the house, I would eat it. So on this particular day, all I could find were my daughter's toddler cookies, but I didn't mind. <laughs> I continued to pull the box out and I started eating it. As I was shoveling it in my mouth, I had this awareness of what it was that I looked like and it shocked me. And in that moment, it kind of broke my state. And I heard for the first time in my life, a voice inside of me that said, go look at yourself in the mirror. Go look at yourself in the mirror. And I'm sitting there going, what? Are you nuts? I'm not gonna go look at myself in the mirror, no way. But this voice persisted. I continued to eat thinking maybe the more I ate it would stuff it down and it would quiet this voice. But the voice whispered, go look at yourself in the mirror. And so I finally grabbed the box. I went into my husband's office. I looked at myself in the mirror and I did not recognize the person looking back at me. I had tears streaming down my face and I realized in that moment that I couldn't stop eating even if I wanted to. And that, to me, that moment where I just saw so clearly what I had become, how far I had gone, how low I had dipped, I knew I needed help. And I went down on my knees and I said, God, help me. Please help me. And then at that time, I felt this feeling, it enveloped me. It was like this feeling of utter, complete love and acceptance. And it filled me up from the inside. And for the first time in my life, I felt unconditional love. And I felt like what it was to be satiated from the inside not trying to stuff myself with food on the outside. And it was the most beautiful, loving feeling that I've ever had. If you're blaming outside of yourself, you lose all of your power. So taking it back and taking responsibility, I created this body right now by the habits that I've been doing for some time now. But the beauty in that is that you can change your thoughts, change your habits, and then create something new for yourself. One night, the day shift had had a party, and I saw what was left of the party, and there was cake, I remember, in the trash cans. And I pulled off that cardboard place, you know, that the cake frosting sticks to, and kind of brushed off the cigarette ashes and whatever else was on there, and got myself some good old used icing. And I remembered thinking, at that time, you know, if you drank, you wouldn't just be somebody who drank too much. You would be one of those guys on Skid Row. So that was my drug of choice, food. And I ate and ate and ate so much. And I must say, I did have a good time putting that weight on. I'm not going to lie to you. People eat because it tastes good, bottom line. So. You're going to have to figure out how to break the addiction without making yourself crazy because food is something that you need to eat on a regular basis where cigarettes and alcohol and drugs and stuff, you can quit that and never see it again and you'll be just fine. When a normal eater eats, they eat and they have enough and then they don't want to eat anymore. But when a compulsive overeater eats, it can just set off the craving. Same thing with an alcoholic. Most people who enjoy a glass of wine, they'll have a glass of wine, maybe they'll have two. That's enough, that's plenty. An alcoholic maybe hasn't had a drink in months. One glass of wine, that's all it takes for the lost weekend to ensue. It's the same thing that happens with a compulsive overeater. I remember one time during my big weight loss period where I completely lost it one weekend. I was visiting a city and I passed by an ice cream emporium and I sat down and I had, I think, the world's largest hot fudge sundae. I just went completely unconscious and I got so sick. 
after eating that hot fudge sundae. Not only did I put on a few pounds by the next day, but I was just sick for several days. And it really taught me a lesson that in the act of growing our spirit, we're gonna come up against the very things we find most unlovable. There's gonna come a point where you're going to have to decide, is it true? Do these belief patterns, do these thought patterns serve me or are they hindering me? Are these beliefs empowering me and inspiring me to live my purpose? Or are they keeping me in that negative downward spiral where I feel like I'm not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not successful enough? You see, we're emotional beings. We're expressing emotions all the time, but we're also habitual beings. So we need to get into the habit of expressing and connecting and feeling those emotions that will draw to us that which we desire. I needed to start loving my body. But in looking in the mirror, I had a very, very difficult time. So I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna start with one thing. What can I say that for today, I like about my body? And it was really hard to come up with it, but I finally came up with that I like my eyes. So every time I passed a mirror from that point on, I would look in the mirror and say, I like my eyes. And I would look deep into my eyes. And then over time, I truly began to say, I love my eyes. And what else can I maybe love about myself? You know, so many people that I've worked with that struggle with eating disorders or obesity, they've lost touch with their physical body. They dissociate or they insulate. You know, for people who've experienced some sort of trauma or abuse, and they've found themselves eating to comfort themselves, as they gain weight, it provides almost a protective shield. And so they've practiced numbing out their pain so they don't feel. In our culture, we're taught to have some ice cream. It'll make you feel better. And growing up like that, you build habits around stuffing those feelings down numbing those feelings when you feel upset or emotional. And when you're traveling this journey and you're focused on the inner way, you come right up against your feelings and your emotions. And it's a scary place to be. And you know that if you eat some ice cream, you won't have to think about it anymore. But if you choose the alternative, to go the inner way and to explore, what is this feeling doing? What does this feeling mean? Then you have an opportunity to express it, to release it, and as a result, you're healed. I have my doctorate degree in psychology. I know what we do in Western thinking. When a negative emotion comes up, rather than dealing with it, we shove it back down. So the negative emotion comes up, you shove it back down. And I ran that pattern. I would go, I want to be healthy. This fear of even going into the gym and having to look at other people that are healthy and deal with my own physical body. And instead of dealing with the fear, I'd shove it back down. You need to not only realize that you have the knowledge inside, you have to be willing to face these things, these fears, these negative emotions. And you need to be willing to release them and let them go. Because I teach the law of attraction. I teach the idea that positive thinking makes a difference, and it does. No amount of positive thinking released my fear. No amount of positive thinking released my sadness. I had to let these things go first. When we think about accepting our overweight, out of shape, cellulite written bodies, we think, no, you know, I can't accept that. But if you were to accept it, what would happen then? What would that make possible? The number one objection that I hear from people about accepting themselves, they say, I can't accept myself as I am. If I accept myself as I am, I'll become lazy. I'll just lie on the sofa and eat bonbons all day. The truth is that when we accept ourselves as we are, exactly as we are, then all of a sudden we want to take great care of ourselves. We want to nurture ourselves. Think of a child that you love. When you love a child as it is, you naturally want to take care of that child. You want to nurture the child. 
It's like you have seeds planted in a garden. And if you want those seeds to sprout and grow, you have to nurture them with love and acceptance. And once I started appreciating my body exactly as it is, my body responded in a very positive way. And I went from a size 12 and now I'm a size two. When you are eating and eating and eating and you cannot get enough food, that is a sign that your deeper needs are not being met. When you are stuffing yourself with food, that is your personal love letter from the universe saying something is not working in your life. One of the turning points that I can remember was this um, psychologist that I started working with when I was maybe 20 years old who was the first one to introduce me to the idea that my food was related to my emotions. And he made me write a journal where I would write on the left column what I ate that day, and I would have to write on the right column how I felt when I ate. And so, for instance, we started tracking that Nutella, which is very sweet, very smooth, very kind of gooey, would come when my emotions was more related to feeling lonely maybe, or feeling disconnected from other people, when eating chips were more related to moments of anger and unspoken kind of inner rage maybe. So I started to connect that some feelings were attracting different foods. And that became a very interesting awareness for me to start tracking, mm, I'm eating chips, I wonder what, what's going on, and start using that as, as, a, as a conversation with myself. Am I angry right now? Is there someone I need to talk to right now? And that was the, the, the beginning of that kind of new generation was to start building an awareness of how my relationship with my food was very much my relationship with myself. I used to get emotions out of food that really belong in my relationship. I used to feel a tenderness when I would eat ice cream. Food is not meant to give you positive feelings. It's not meant to give you a hug. It's not meant to give you a warm fuzzy. And I've had people say to me, no, 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 chocolate will do that for you. And I say, yes, it will. And I understand chemically it will. You need to, at some point, separate the food from the emotion that you get. And then go get those emotions where they are meant to be coming from. Most of us talk to ourselves in ways that we wouldn't talk to our worst enemy. If we were to change the way we talk to ourselves, because if you're constantly criticizing yourself, you're going to feel bad. After a while, pretty quickly, you're going to be really successful at making yourself feel just awful. And we know what we do when we feel awful. We want to eat. What if you started speaking to yourself as you would speak to your best friend? What kind of change would that make for you? When I first thought of the concept that, wow, I need to love and accept myself, my mind immediately came up with a million reasons why that was not possible. You know, like, how do you love yourself if you weigh 320 pounds? Or how do you love yourself if you're sucking on Marlboros, which I was all day long? Then I had a realization that really changed my life, which was the idea that, well, what do you think love is for? What is it that actually needs to be loved if not my 120 pounds, if not my addiction to cigarettes? And so the power of love is such that you can love yourself for not being able to love yourself. You can love the unlovable. I know, I mean, it sounds strange to even think that way because it sounded strange to me, but when I realized suddenly that's the stuff that needs to be loved. One of the things that I have learned on my journey is that I had a lot of false body images. I think a lot of people out there, you know, we look at these magazines, these models, and we think we need to live up to this image. The thing is, we don't allow our bodies to be the bodies they want to be. We have to get rid of these false body images. In order to change your body, you have to accept it, which means love it first. And with that love, they appreciate the body will respond. I guarantee you about that. It's just a proven fact. But if you hate your body, you don't like your body, and you just say, I'll be happy, I love my body, only when I look like a Angelina Jolie or Madonna, uh, good luck. Before, 
I think I had a relationship with my body like a store mannequin where I was just looking at it. It was about the way it looked. And I was comparing it to the magazines and the fashion models. And when I would compare it, it always fell short. And so therefore I was always disappointed in it. When I stopped comparing it and I stopped looking at how my body looks and I started realizing all that this body does for me every day and that this body is a vehicle for my spirit. How could I not love it? I just had a new love affair with this amazing body, this amazing gift. And so it was really like turning on the lights for the first time and falling in love with someone that had been there all along and I just never saw it before. Another trick that I would recommend when you are really filled with shame and self-loathing about who you are is put up a picture of yourself as a small child. This reminds you of who you really are because most of us look at children and we see them as innocent. So if you can put up a picture of yourself, it reminds you of the innocence that is in you. And that can help you love and forgive yourself no matter what you see on the outside. I've been given this body not to beat up, not to put down, because we say sometimes we say things to ourselves that we would never say to anyone else. And you have to remember that every time you say those things to yourself, your body takes it personally. You need to begin to say positive things to yourself, positive encouragement. And you need to begin to talk to yourself like you would a child that you are in charge of, a, a child that you are a parental figure for, someone that you love and care about. Because that's really when your body begins to hear those messages, you find that change comes a lot faster. You've got to accept the fact that this is your body. You've got to accept the fact that it's the way it is. Now, someone else may have programmed you that caused your body to be the way it is, and you can blame them if you want, but blame is a silly game because that makes you a victim. Although someone else may have been responsible for making you who you are, you are responsible for changing who you are. Do you know Huxley, the great English writer, he said there's only one corner of the universe you can change, and that's your own self. Start with the inner way. All the information you're getting on this film is doing it for you. Take what everybody said and wrap it all up in one neat idea. Build a picture of the person you want to be, get emotionally involved with the picture, and it's the inner way from this point on. You know, I abused my body for years. I threw up for years. Then I was overeating. Then I was undereating. Then I was trying to starve myself. Then I was this health nut trying to follow every health regimen that came along. And yet my body was still here. My body gave birth to four amazing children. It nursed them for eight years. I ran a marathon. My body allows me to wake up every day and live in this world. It allows me to connect with other people and, and to make love with my husband and to eat delicious food. What a gift. Appreciate your body that despite how unkindly you may have treated it, it is still here for you. Can you start there? Can you start with an inkling of gratitude? The entire process of mental adjustment and attunement can be summed up in one word, gratitude. Be very grateful for everything you've got going for you. Be very grateful for all the great information that you have attracted to you. You've attracted this information. You've attracted me into your life. You've attracted Gay Hendricks, Dave, you know, Mary Morrissey into your life. It's not an accident we're here. Put it down to anything you want, but I'm going to tell you this, you've attracted everything. We're here to help you. You want to be grateful for it. That'll help you make the mental adjustment and help you tune in with the laws of your being. Gratitude hooks you up to your source of supply. Most of us are living lives that aren't what we want. We're not grateful until the form comes, until the th I'll, be gra I'll be happy with myself when I lose 50 pounds. I'll be happy with myself when this thing happens, when I finally have a bank account big enough, or when I finally have the home, or I finally have the partner, or whatever it is we think is the thing that's going to fulfill us. We seek to get it before we allow ourselves to feel, and it's backwards. This is the inner way. The inner way is that we get the picture and we begin to imagine living that life 
the best we can. Imagine being the person who is living that life. That person probably does some dishes. That person still probably does some laundry. That person drives their car. And so you begin putting it on, being that person. And how would that person walk through the grocery store? What kind of food would that person pick? What, what reading is that person doing? What's the conversation? You can bet that the person who's living, who is living the life you're imagining is not complaining, they're grateful. And so as we put on gratitude, we begin to find that ideas that are harmonious with the outcomes we want to create start coming to us. Thought is the sculptor who can create the person you want to be. I really encourage you to take a moment and imagine what life would be like when this is no longer a problem for you. Your whole life changes in the best possible way because this problem in and of itself is weighing you down and it's taking up so much mind space there's, not a, there's no room for anything else. So if you can begin to imagine what your life would be like without this weight problem, you can begin to pull in what you really want. So if you put on right now an imagined image of yourself, what would you really like to weigh? What would you love to look like? How do you want to feel in your body? How flexible do you want to be? What is your stamina? How much strength do you have? Do you sleep easily? Do you wake up uh, alert and alive and ready for the day. What is the image you would like to put on for yourself? When I give workshops and I have people walk up to me and say how much better they felt after the workshop and then sometimes the next day they would call me and say things like, I couldn't believe it. At work today everybody said how much thinner I looked or how much better I looked, that I looked great. And I said, well, yes, yeah, that's, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Can you believe what your thoughts do? They can control your physical body instantly. You can be thinner instantly just because your posture is different, your bearing is different, and if you will, your aura is different. The aura about you is different. How you feel about yourself is different. So every facial movement is going to be different. And people will just look at you differently. If it's hard for you to visualize yourself living and thriving at your natural weight, you might want to try this exercise. Stand in front of a mirror and take a piece of imaginary chalk and outline the outside of your body. Now, when you're looking in the mirror, you're then going to visualize that inner body that you want to create, your new body. So then take another piece of imaginary chalk and draw the lines of that inside the other chalk marks. And what you will see when you visualize that is that the woman or man you're trying to create is already within you. You're already within your chalk marks that you originally created. If you're growing a garden, for example, and you plant seeds, and you've got this wonderful soil, and you till the soil, and you prepare the soil, and to me, that's also allowing myself to be more positive. And I plant these positive thoughts, and I nurture them, and I water the garden. I don't expect it to grow overnight. I expect that it will take a short time, maybe a few days, but I do see progress. When I start seeing weeds, however, I need to protect that new growth, so I need to pull the weeds. And to me, those weeds are the negative thoughts that I'm gonna have, because I'm human, as well as spirit. I'm also human, and I do have those negative thoughts, just like anyone. I used to not be able to get my day going without stepping on the scales. That was how I started my day, and it would usually be stepping on my scales and finding that I was 100 pounds more than I wanted to be, but somehow I just obsessively had to step on those scales every morning. I haven't stepped on one now in a long time. I think the act of stepping on a scales for most people is an act of self-sabotage and self-punishment. So I look people right in the eye and I say, can you imagine a life where you never thought about stepping on scales again? 
Studies show that after you've increased your weight, if you lock it in for at least three years, some scientists say five, even though your genes said you were supposed to be 125, you can reset your little set point and say, no, I'm supposed to be 155. And so every time you try to diet and you bring that scale down, the brain says, what are you doing, silly? I'm supposed to be 155. It literally alters your metabolism. It alters the way your body holds on to nutrients and hoards it to keep you back to that higher weight. Well, guess what they discovered about 10 years ago? They discovered that you, through your conscious mind, can influence your set point. That's right. You can influence your brain. So that part of your brain that says, Oh no, I'm supposed to be 155, not 125. Through the power of your conscious thoughts, you can start to change it. If I say to you right now, don't eat, don't think about food, the first thing you're gonna do is think about eating and think about food. What we wanna do is we wanna change our language. We wanna change the way that we talk to ourselves so we're focused on what we do want instead. So you could say to yourself, for example, I'm going to a party and I'm scared about overeating and I'm telling myself not to eat, well, ask yourself this question, this one question, which is incredibly powerful. The question is, how would I like to be instead? So I now imagine myself going to that party. What am I gonna focus on if it's not the food table? I'm gonna focus on the people, for example. I'm gonna focus on connecting with the people that are there. And before we know it, the food table fades into the background and the connection with the people in the party comes into clear focus for ourselves. I was working with someone who's lost a lot of weight and she has her fat clothes. What do you do with your fat clothes? Everyone says, throw out your fat clothes or you're planning on gaining it back, but she didn't want to throw them out. She's not ready to throw out her fat clothes. She was willing to box up her fat clothes and put them into her closet, but she wasn't willing to throw them out or give them away. I said, how about writing a note to your fat clothes? What would you say to your fat clothes? And she said, dear fat clothes, thank you very much for all you've done for me. I hope I never see you again. Love, Beth. And I thought, boy, that was really great. And I was like, you just broke up with your fat clothes. I want you to sit down and totally relax. Totally relax. Become very quiet. Turn off the TV, the radio, get away from everybody. And I want you to just totally relax, and I want you to let your imagination run wild. And I want you to build a picture of exactly what you want to look like. And then I want you to take a pen and a pad and begin to write out a description of it. And start by writing, I'm so happy and grateful now that and describe the image that you've got. Now, while you're doing this, your old paradigm's gonna say, Betty, Harry, this is nuts. This is never going to work. Proctor doesn't understand all the problems you've got. Listen, Proctor does understand. Proctor's overcome the problems, and he's telling you how to do it. I want you to really be specific. What would it look like? What would it feel like? What would life be like when you get to your goal? And don't tie it to a number. I think sometimes we get so fixed on a certain number or a certain weight or a certain dress size. I want you to tie it to how you will live your life. If you weren't obsessing about carbs and points and food and, and how you looked and whether your butt was looking fat, if you could focus on how you would live your passion at that goal. As soon as you trust yourself, you will know how to live. Trust yourself. Believe that you are worthy of a joyful life. If you believe that you are worthy of feeling good, feeling vital and whole and healthy, then you are not going to want to stuff your body with things that make you feel like crap. To change your subconscious mind and to really un have an understanding of all of this, you have to repeat it. You have to really embrace it, not just program yourself, but to embrace every aspect. So watch this, learn about this, take this in, and each day embrace a new aspect of every bit of these teachings to help you to really grow and become and to create a beautiful you. You know, the Buddhist texts, they all start with this, this phrase, O oh, nobly born. 
that's what you are. We all are. We are nobly born. And all this other stuff on this outside, you know, my flabby thighs and, and my peccadillos and my habits and my overeating and the crankiness I have and I get irritable, all those kind of human feelings, those are not who we really are. Who we really are is nobly born. And every time you care for yourself, you are stripping away those barriers that keep you from that true self, that allow that true self to come out and shine and manifest in your life. So self-care for me is a bridge. It's the bridge between your humanity and your spirituality. It's how they meet. It's how you bring that spiritual, that inner way, that true being that you are out into your physical life. The truth is that, that the divine self, that spirit is within. If we are allow ourselves to go in deep enough, deep, deeply below the fears, of not being good enough. If we sink to a level even below that, that's where we find the divine within. It is within us. And in finding that, we have tapped into a tremendous source of power, way more than we could ever have just on our own, trying to use willpower. The way to activate the inner divine wisdom is actually creating the space through silence. It's when you are sitting and you're alone and you're able to allow that silence to take over inside of you. That's when that inner voice becomes stronger than all the outer voices of the world. So every day as you're nurturing this seed with love, what are you doing? What are you doing to nurture it? What are you actually doing in your day-to-day -day life? Well, how about as you wake up in the morning, you begin to talk to yourself much more lovingly than you ever have. You begin to tell yourself that you're doing great, that you're getting a little bit thinner, that you feel a little bit thinner and stronger, and that you love yourself no matter what. And then when you look in the mirror all throughout the day, you begin to see the changes. You notice the changes. Even if they're not really there, you can pretend you're changing because it works. Willpower is not the way to go. If there is ever a war between the willpower and the imagination, the imagination is going to win hands down every time. Just hold the image of what you want. There should be no struggle to live the way you want to live. Let the image hold and guide you, and then let your intuition tell you what you can, what you can't eat. You see, no diet's the right diet for a person that's got the wrong image, and there's no food that's the wrong food if you're living through your intuitive factor from the image you've got inside. If your body says you need a steak, eat it. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Trust that up and down of your needs. Trust them as valid. Part of this journey is befriending your needs and befriending your hunger. Your hunger is not the enemy. You're a human being. You'll get hungry at times. Listen to it. The hunger that I'm talking about is a little whisper. It's, it's your body saying, I could eat, I need a little fuel. It gives you time to prepare a meal or um, order in a restaurant and you can have your food be served to you rather than you're so hungry that you devour the whole bread basket just because you've gotten too hungry. What you're looking for is the slightest whisper of, of I'm hungry. And then, um, and how you might figure that out is actually checking in with your body. What does it feel like to be hungry for you? Like for me, it's a small growl in my stomach, might be a little bit lightheaded, and because I'm connected to my body, I, I kind of know when my blood sugar is starting to dip a little bit. So it's learning to tap into your body's physical cues of hunger so that when you feel those sensations in your body, then you know, oh, it's time to eat. The inner way is paying attention to things like hunger signals. What is my body telling me it wants right now? How hungry am I? And most importantly, this key question, which is how will this food that I eat make me feel over time? Not just in the moment, but over time. 
When you find yourself at a restaurant or a grocery store or wherever you're going to make a food choice, you'll notice conflicting feelings. Part of you is going to want what brings the temporary comfort, and part of you knows that you've made decisions about how you want to be. And one of the things that I've learned is to put on the new person. Instead of coming from the person who wants to lose weight, start being the person who makes the choices that reflect the person you want to be. So when you say, who does the thin person in me choose? Who does the thin person in me pick? And I simply have learned to say over time, what's the healthier choice I can make in the moment? I don't always make the healthiest choice I can make in the moment, but I make healthier and healthier and healthier choices when I give myself permission to have a bite or two of something I really want, but I don't want the whole thing. And here's one of the things that I first found was that people that were in a state of unhealthy, unhealthy way, unhealthy behavior like I was, you know what foods you need to eat. You know what foods you need to stay away from. I realized that at 202 pounds, my daily habits created that body. And when I took personal responsibility, my choices created that body. It was wonderful because if I can create that, I can create something else. I can create something better by my daily choices. So I just started to move forward every day. I did something every day that moved me closer to my goal. I wasn't expecting perfection. I was expecting consistency. I, I made a decision. I thought, OK, if everything I've eaten up until now has resulted in this particular 320-pound body, what I'm going to do from here on out is do my best to eat only things that will feed my spirit rather than things that will feed my old programmed overweight body. And I remember the first, first day of this, all I could find in the refrigerator were some blueberries, some fresh blueberries. And I remember eating the first blueberry, just kind of savoring the blueberry and asking myself, OK, does that feel like it feeds my spirit? Yeah, it does. It doesn't feel like it feeds that old body of mine. And so I ate another blueberry, and then I ate another blueberry. And I remember it only took about three blueberries, and I felt full because I was paying so much attention to that quality of, of spirituality in the food rather than paying attention to the calories of it or the, mm, mm, the mouth taste of it or anything like that. I was kind of asking a different question. When you are attached and fixated to a certain way of eating, when you are a vegetarian or a vegan or a, you're on a high protein diet or you're on low fat, whatever it is, you're honestly usually doing it with the best of intentions. You're trying to get healthy. But what's missing from that is your unique body and your unique body's needs. So it's like that there's this box and you are trying to fit yourself into this box. OK, I'm going to be a vegetarian, or I'm going to be a vegan, or I'm going to eat like the USDA, the food pyramid, tells me to eat. But when you do that, then what happens is you're trying to fit yourself into this one-size-fits-all box, and it doesn't fit. Instead, you need to make the box fit around you. So you start eating foods and going, OK, when I eat chicken and zucchini, how do I feel? You know, when I eat ice cream, how do I feel? And then you start to self-center because you're listening to your own body instead of being other-centered and listening to diet books and listening to this program and that program, which can never work because it isn't tailor-made for you. Make it a point to slow down your eating because when you eat fast, you're more likely to consume more food than you should. And it contributes to your weight gain in a major way. So what you want to do is put the food in your mouth and practice something I call mindfulness when the food is in your mouth. And what that means is you're appreciating the flavor of the food, the texture of the food, the smell of the food. And this forces you to eat more slowly. And here in the Western world, we are unconscious eaters. How many times have you caught yourself sitting on the couch, throwing some chips or some cookies back only to realize they're gone? in the blink of an eye, because you've been unconscious. You haven't been really thinking about what you're putting in your mouth. Since I started to really practice conscious eating, and it's been a long time, I, I don't miss anything. I can watch television later. I can talk on the phone later. But it's a special moment for me. When I eat, sometimes I like to share food with friends, and that's wonderful. 
Food, it's a special moment when we receive energy from the divine. It's a special moment where we can feel literally this beautiful pleasure inside. Conscious eating or mindful eating means that you're going to look at this as a process for fueling your body, fueling your life. It starts with the way you prepare your meals. Prepare something that is tasty, that is you know, pleasing to the eye so that you can start your body to think that, oh, I'm ready to bring in nutrients that are gonna fuel me, that are gonna energize me, that's going to heal me and not harm me. Eating until you're 80% full actually allows you to eat at a comfortable level because it takes about 15 or 20 minutes before the stomach can send the signal to the brain, I'm full. So if you eat slowly, if you chew your food, if you're in a stress-free, quiet environment, you're able to register when you're 80% full so you can stop then what happens is that after you stop eating, you feel yourself getting fuller and fuller. And this is the signal from your stomach going to your brain, uh, in fact, I am full. One day I had a new client come into my office and I was wanting to teach her all of the principles of listening to her body and choosing food that she really liked. And it was around noon. And I said to her, are you hungry? And she said, yeah, actually I am. She was, it was a few minutes before she was going to leave my office. And I said, well, what do you feel like eating? What's your favorite food? And she said, oh, I would love to have a grilled cheese sandwich. I haven't had a grilled cheese sandwich in so many years because it's so fattening. It's going to make me fat. And I said, well, you now have the complete freedom to have exactly what you want to eat. Do you have any idea of where you could get a grilled cheese sandwich? And she said, oh, yeah, I could find a place. And so she left and came back the next week, and she was so excited, she came bouncing into my office and said, I can't wait to tell you my story. I said, what happened? She said, well, I went to this restaurant, and she said, you're not gonna believe this. They were having grilled cheese week, and every day of the week they were doing a different kind of grilled cheese sandwich, and it was so exciting, and I ordered a grilled cheese sandwich and a salad, because I like salad, and I ate half of the sandwich and some of the salad, and I thought, I'm not hungry anymore, I'm full. And I can come back tomorrow and have a different grilled cheese sandwich tomorrow. And she was so excited, nothing like that had happened to her in her life really, because she had been dieting most of her life. A thought that's pretty common is people feel they belong to the clean plate club because that's something that they were taught by their parents or their grandparents. That is definitely something, a thought that I unwind a lot with my clients. So if you believe that you must clean your plate, even though you're not hungry, you're, you're disconnecting from your body. So I teach my clients to adopt the habit of wasting food. I mean, you obviously don't want to just buy it just to throw it away. But to me, if you are eating food that is more than what your body requires for fuel, it's a waste either way. Saying a blessing every time you sit down to a meal is so powerful. You can thank the farmers in the field. You can thank all the people who drove that food to the grocery store. You can thank yourself for actually going to the store and buying this beautiful, abundant, colorful food. When you bless the food and bless the people around it that their hands have touched it, the food takes on a new energy and it's filled with life. And as you are eating it and consuming it, your body knows that it is blessed food. I learned from a friend and mentor of mine a long time ago that for a compulsive overeater, it is equally and maybe more important to say a prayer after the meal because we need closure. A problem for somebody who has an eating compulsion is when's the end? Dinner is good, so let's just keep eating it. So to say a prayer at the end of the meal is a beautiful punctuation. Now how my friend came to this was that she's a Protestant lady who visited a Catholic mass. And she was interested to hear that at the end of the service, the priest says, the mass is ended, go in peace. So she started using this as her after meals prayer. The meal has ended, I go in peace. It works. Busy, busy, busy people, let me say something to you. You cannot afford not to exercise. How about we don't even call it exercise? Let's call it movement. 
you have to make your body move more than it is right now. Because if your body does not move, you will become weak. Your bones will be weak. Your muscles will be weak. Your metabolism will slow down. So much of what we do to take care of our bodies comes from other people. We go and lift weights even though we hate it because some expert says we have to go and lift weights. When you may be someone who feels really good walking every morning, trust your body. If you like to dance, dance. If you like to swim, swim. If you wake up one day and you're exhausted and your body tells you you need to rest, rest. Wherever you start out at, that's fine. I mean, if you just like walking, by all means do that. If you like yoga, some people like weight training, some people like kickboxing, some people like spin. Me, I don't like spinning. <laughs> I tried it once, never do it again. It's not something I enjoyed. It obviously works for other people. It just doesn't work for me. So I like yoga, I like, I like walking, I love walking, I like rollerblading. You know, find something that works for you because you're more likely to do it if it's something you enjoy. It's getting out and working the muscles I want to work, playing in the water, I'm swimming, I'm doing yoga every morning, hiking, I'm doing all of those things. Every day I'm doing something because it feels good, because I want to do it. So it's totally different when you're thinking from the inner way. And so if you can connect to that childlike spirit that's inside of you, that enjoys moving your body, having fun, what feels good for you in your body, then you're going to develop a positive relationship with exercise. I think the real magic of the inner way is finding your own true compass inside, finding your own reference point in your own spiritual life inside yourself. I heard lots of women's stories and all of their pitfalls, all of their stumbling blocks. One main challenge a lot of weight loss companies never address is the spiritual aspect. There's no mention of virtues like love, patience, peace, inspiration, encouragement, generosity. And these are the virtues that make you strong enough to continue to eat right and to exercise and to take care of your body and to love yourself. Live the way you want to live. Build the image and understand the law will see that it moves into form. It must. That's an absolute law. A law is something that works every time for every person everywhere. So when a client comes to me and they want to lose weight, we put no attention on their weight. We put attention on what they want to create on a dream. And we get them so involved in falling in love with creating a project or something they want to build or something they want to give. Because what happens is when you fall in love with a bigger idea, what was your problem diminishes in its hold on you because you're moving at a frequency that is much more compatible with a life that is what you really want to live. So we talk about healthy choices and talk about healthy responsibility and we talk about patterns, but we don't focus on the weight, we focus on a dream. What would you love your life to be like? And how can we make today a little more like that? What action step can you take today? Because your weight is only one part of your life. If you are someone who is struggling with weight, I would ask you to look at that weight as a symbol. What is weighing you down? What feels heavy and draining to you? I have yet to meet a person who struggles with weight who is living a life that truly feeds and nourishes them. You need to look at your life and say, what is missing? What makes me feel fulfilled? I believe that each and every one of us kind of comes to this life with our own personal mission, <laughs> if you will. And though we might kind of get put into these little boxes of conformity, there comes a point in almost every person's life when they realize, I'm not living my passion, or I'm not living my dream. I may have done what I was told to do, or what I thought was the most prudent thing for me to do. But what I've seen over the last uh, two decades is that when we deny our soul's passion, when we're not living our dreams, when we're not living up to our own potential, then that is when dis-ease manifests. We are so much more than our bodies and so much more than a number on a scale. 
Our purpose here in life is to feel and know love. When we feel and know love, that is the springboard that allows us to accomplish our dreams, to be who we were destined to be. But it starts with love. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. One of the things that I like to help people get really clear on is the power of recommitment and forgiveness on their journey. And I say to people that commitment is important, but recommitment is where the magic is. So if you have struggled with weight and with body image, the solution is already there. The solution is in turning to yourself and saying, what do I need? How can I love and care for myself? It is not the universe trying to punish you. It is the universe trying to wake you up into the fullest expression of who you are. So I tell people, get good at forgiveness and recommitment on your journey because you're gonna have plenty of opportunities to use both of those things. A sailboat has a destination in mind, the captain does, but nobody goes straight line. They tack, they go back and forth, a little off track and then they come back, and then a little off track and then they come back. The key is to keep your destination in mind and then with each choice, do your best to make your healthiest choice in that moment. And when you find yourself making an unhealthy choice, you just simply say to yourself, next. It's the most beautiful journey because it's the journey of discovering yourself inside and letting go so that the true you can come out. Life is not an end, it's an aim. Life is a journey. And so you shouldn't think that I'm gonna get to this one place and I'll be there. In fact, people that I've met who are magnificent at health, they don't see it as this final goal of getting to a certain weight. They see it as a continual process, like everything else in life. You know, you could sum up everything I've said, you could sum up everything that you've heard on here to one sentence. You become what you think of. That's the one point that all great leaders have agreed on. They've disagreed on virtually everything else, but that one point, as a person thinketh in their heart, the heart is the subconscious mind. That's what the early Greeks called the subconscious mind. As a person thinks in their subconscious mind, so are they. Make certain that the thoughts that you have of you are beautiful. Don't be shy. Build a beautiful image of yourself and then live it. You will see your life change right before your own eyes. And you will start looking in the mirror and you will really look in those eyes and you'll say, I love you. So I invite you to just believe in yourself, tap into that internal potential, and let's really transform this life of yours into one that truly honors your dreams. I love myself. I am not beating up on myself for what I ate today. I'm not saying tomorrow I'm going to start another diet. I'm just going to bed and feeling good about myself. That's the big prize, is that you love yourself. That's the big prize. I see you as you choose to be. You're beautiful, you're loving, you're deserving, and you're worthy. I want you to know that you can do this that you are loved more than you could ever imagine. There is a divine wisdom that wants nothing more for you than for you to be happy and to be filled with joy. And you can do this. Not only do I know that it's possible, I know that it's possible for you. And I don't care if your mother's been fat and your father's fat and your dog is fat. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you believe in yourself and that you go out there with persistence, with perseverance, and with patience, gentleness, and kindness to yourself and claim that life that's waiting for you, that is yours, that's waiting to be expressed. I encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and truly tap into this inner divine wisdom because the inner way is the only way. There's no getting around it. The inner way is the only way. 
Three years ago, I set out on a quest to find my inner way. The teachers in this film are the ones I met on my journey. Many of them have shared the same struggle that you and I have. All of them are here to help you. Watch this film over and over. Share it with those you love who are going through the same struggle. Get the concepts firmly planted in your subconscious mind. Your body is an amazing gift. It has been given to you so that you can experience life and experience it with abundance. You can have the body and the life that you want. Just be willing to face yourself, imagine yourself, and more than anything, trust yourself. And I promise you, you will find your inner way. I know the inner way. I feel the inner way. I have found my inner way. <laughs>